Hello? Hey, it's Mark Sargent. Hi. Again. Are, are you recording right now? Uh, I can, if you wish. All right. That would be great if you could. All right. I have turned on the button. You, We are now recording. Of course, we can edit around, so you can say whatever you want. Yeah. It's no big deal. Yeah. All right. So, Sam's here with me. Sam. Hey, how are you doing? Hey. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then this, uh, my teacher is also here, Mr. Sharp. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm Nathan and Sam's teacher. We're, we're doing a podcasting elective. <laughs> and so they want to hear you on their podcast. Is that okay? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, Nathan's prepared some questions for you. Okay. All right. Um, so I watched your documentary uh, again last night, and I saw that you have these light of passes. Just, uh, we're going to get those light of passes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, say it, say it last part one more time. You were, you cut out for a second. So, uh, in your in your documentary, yeah, uh, on for the last scene, it shows you wearing those light of glasses. Oh, those those them. neon those neon glasses I got from Amazon. Yeah, yeah aren't those cool? I'm gonna go get a pair of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. Um. So. How, how did you how did you discover the flat earth theory? I discovered it because I tried to shoot down the the theory back in 2014. So I had looked at just about every conspiracy. I, had, I have an opinion on just about every conspiracy you can think of, and I was bored. And everybody in the conspiracy world hates flat earth, and so I thought, you know what? I've never really looked into it. I'm going to look into it, and I thought I could disprove it in a weekend. And then uh, nine months later, uh, beginning of 2015, that's when I said, you know what, I'm going to make a series of YouTube videos called The Flat Earth Clues and kind of put it out there on the internet and see mm -hmm. what happens, you know, see, see if it gets shot down. And that was four years ago, and here we are many conferences later, and I don't know how many interviews and how many meetups. And in fact, after, like, next week, I'm heading off to a... Flat Earth Conference in London, and then jumping over to Stockholm, and then back to the States and for the big one. Well, there's another one in South Carolina, and then the big one in Dallas, Texas. So, all right. Oh, and I'm sorry to to the first I, the the first one. I I didn't hear it the 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 first time. the The neon glasses. All you have to do is type in uh, neon glasses into Amazon, and I think they cost all of like fifteen dollars. And all right, nice. And the, the whole reason I got them was because I knew that Patricia Steer was going to be wearing an actual ball gown. And no matter what I wore, no one was going to be looking at me. So I <laughs> thought I could beat her with technology. And so I got this neon set of glasses and a bow tie, which, you know, some people will use like for prom and homecoming. And, uh, and the yeah. room was dark enough that it worked. And uh, that was, in fact, that was one of the shots they used for the poster in the um uh for the movie mm -hmm. so in your documentary i see that a lot of people went up to you and asked you oh are you mark Sargent? how many people uh recognize you on the street a lot more now um be be before patricia steer had me do video work with her it was mostly audio. People would know me for my voice. You know, that's, I mean, I, most of the stuff I did was audio, including this. And, but after Netflix bought the rights to the film, uh, I mean, beforehand it was like on iTunes and Amazon and YouTube Red and Google Play and stuff. But I, I did not realize that basically everybody under the age of 30 owns Netflix. So once Netflix came out, yeah, I was, I, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I was flying to a conference in New Zealand this year and a guy was going through the aisles, you know, because they hand out food constantly during those long flights. And he go, he was handing out bread and he goes, you want any bread? I go, no, I don't want any bread. He goes, you sure? You don't want any bread? And he's looking right at me. And I go, okay, fine. I'll take a couple of those little garlic things. He goes, yeah, you want those garlic things because they're flat and round. <laughs> and it's like, What? And I look at him, I go, really? He goes, yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, he absolutely knew the documentary. And, and so, yeah, I, I get that all the time from, from people. So I, I don't go out as much as I probably should. 
Uh, I was wondering, how long did it take to make the documentary? The documentary itself took seven months to shoot. And ju just so you know, I didn't, I didn't actually shoot it. I was just the protagonist in the film. Uh, it was shot by a company down in Los Angeles, down, down in Hollywood, called Delta V Productions. Really small, bare bones production house. And we started filming in April of end of April, beginning of May, 2017. And they finished shooting December. 2017 and we did our first film festival in april the toronto film festival in april of 2018 so it took it took about two or three months to edit and seven months seven months to shoot all right um so you have a book called the skies of the i haven't read it but uh where could i find it and how uh what like, how can I get a hold of it? Okay, The Sky's the Limit. Uh, Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's the Limit is on Amazon. All you have to do is type in Flat Earth Clues into Amazon. You'll find it. Um, and it's published for, by a group out in London called Boogles Publishing. And in fact, it's funny you'd mention that because uh, my second book, which is coming out next week, is called Flat Earth Clues, End of the World, which goes, it's kind of a recap of everything that's happened, how we got here. You know, it's its for anyone that's missed the last four years. It's like, okay, here's the crib notes on how to get up to speed. And that'll be on, that'll be on Amazon as well. Mark? Yes. I think we lost you there for saying, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um... So, first of all, congratulations on your new book. It's coming. It's coming out next week. Yep. Yep. Um, next week. Is there any like special stories about uh, behind the curve when you were filming it? Uh, yeah, yeah. The um, like for example, when when we first started, the they didn't even know if they were gonna make it. They just flew up here and they said, "Hey, what, you know, you want to go out for pizza?" And so I went out with them. Uh, the director and uh, the later the producers came up and we we talked for I don't know 30 40 minutes and he realized you know what let's just grab the cameras and start shooting some stuff and so that first scene where I'm on the beach kind of just talking that literally was that's chronologically correct that was that was absolutely true um, there was also something else which I thought was interesting which is the by the time we get to the end of filming the directors really didn't like uh they didn't like us very much in terms of the topic they liked me just fine and the people just fine they didn't like the topic and that was because you know there was um and i i know i don't know how old you are but you know there was a 12 year old uh guy who asked me a question at the conference in raleigh and they were really concerned about that they was like oh, i don't know if kids should be you know learning this <laughs> it's like why why is it's just an alternative way of thinking, an alternative way of looking at the world, and and happened to be something that all cultures looked at at one point or another. So I thought that was that was kind of interesting. Um, other than that, nothing too outlandish. You know, we we shot at the eclipse. Oh, okay, here's one for you, and th and this goes into the power of editing. Like for example, when when they were showing us at the eclipse down in Oregon for the the great eclipse of 2017 they uh, they were you know they were hyping it up you know like all the mainstream news it's like oh a million people are going to show up in in um uh, salem oregon and they didn't in fact the streets we we were walking around that evening you know shot a lot of footage in the streets of salem and it was absolutely empty and yet they didn't they didn't tell that story so again there's you can do a lot with editing oh sorry last story uh, uh of editing um the green button shot where I supposedly was at the Space Center down in Houston and didn't hit the green button. That was just, they found that by accident, which was, they they figured, well, you know, because when they were zooming in, when, when you're editing film, you make sure the people leave frame and you keep your camera moving. That way you have something you can edit be, behind. And they thought, oh, hey, why don't we just take out the part where Mark actually hit the button and make him look like he missed an obvious giant green button. And they did, and they apologized to me for that, but you know, they, they didn't ever let it be known in the film, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, did you receive any backlash from making the film? Not or as... Like no, 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 not as much as you might think. I mean, the, like, for example, the Flat Earth community hated it, no question, because, you know, we don't... 
most of the Flyers community doesn't like hearing dissenting voices. So we didn't want to see an astronaut up on screen or a scientist or a psychologist or any of those guys. Um, but when I went to the film festivals and I went to several of them, uh, I, and I didn't know how it was any, you know, most of the audience are, are not flat earthers and it generated a lot of interest, a lot of questions like, like you guys have now. And it was, that was interesting. So it became kind of like a Trojan horse for us. It generated so much interest in the topic that people say, oh, you, you know, would you have changed anything if you would have gone back and, and remade the film? And I said, well, if I had to go, if I, you know, not that I had any power over the original editing, but if I had to go back and change anything, I'd probably change the ending where they took a shot at uh, Jaronism with the uh, with the laser experiment, because that was completely out of context. But again, you know, it was their movie. So, you know, we just signed the waivers and said, all right, do with it what you want. But the exposure was totally Sorry, worth so it. The exposure was totally worth it. Mm -hmm. So... Like you were, I think you were talking about the uh, laser experiment. Yeah. Uh, that was, in, I believe that was the final uh, scene of, of the movie. Yep. Where, yep. Yep. Um, can you explain that to the viewers or listeners about what that, what that was exactly? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, well, of course, by the time we got to the laser experiment, which was almost 100 minutes into the film, and the film was only about 100 minutes long, uh, most people were so blown away by the whole topic that they didn't even know what went wrong. And I know this for a fact because I asked all sorts of audience members. I go, do you know what happened with the laser experiment? And they go, no, we don't. But something was bad, right? Something went wrong. It, it, it's, I, go, I go, yeah, but do you know what it was? They go, no. So the whole concept was is that if you shoot a laser is perfectly straight, uh, you know, uh, gravity isn't going to bend a laser beam at any great length at distance. It's just it's just too light and, and too fast. And the, the experiment was, OK, if a laser is perfectly straight, then you should be able to shoot over a flat piece of ground and hit something at range uh, if you can get past the whole beam dispersal thing, you know, because an average like a like a laser pointer that you buy down at the drugstore, I think it spreads like two feet per mile. So what that means is if you're if you fire that laser two miles away, that little pinpoint is going to expand to something that's four feet wide. And that's what Jaron ran into with the first test. But what he didn't realize what, what everyone's messed up was is that Jaron never looked at the ground during the daytime. So he didn't even know if it was flat. He didn't even know if he had line of sight. He just took the film crew out there during the, you know, just live. Let's just do it live the first time. It's like, what? You, you, and we didn't know this till after the fact. And so the, the short version is, is that Jaron never even had line of sight. So no, that laser was never going to hit until he raised it up over the, the berm of the hill he was shooting over. Uh, but again, the editor wasn't going to explain that, and they, you know, they just they left it as kind of like a funny thing at the end, where it's like, oh, well, Jaron obviously proved the curvature of the Earth, which he didn't. Um, how many podcasts have you been on? Oh Lord, uh, I don't, including mainstream interviews. I. I lost count, really. I stopped counting after about 300, I think. I tried to count up until, I think, in the 200s. And, like, my YouTube channel, I think I've got 200 and something posted. But there's a whole bunch that I couldn't record or, I, for whatever reason, like, the network wouldn't let me post. Like, like for example, I did a National Geographic interview. And for copyright reasons, I'm not even allowed to put it on my channel. I'm not allowed to reproduce it. Uh, and that goes with a lot of, in fact, like the documentary, I can't, for obvious reasons, I can't put that on my channel, but hundreds, hundreds and hundreds starting almost immediately in 2015 and continuing now. <laughs> in fact, in fact, what's funny is we, we, in fact, not just, not just podcasts, but the, like, like I did a full blown interview. We made the cover of a popular science magazine just this month. It's on newsstands right now. We have like an eight page spread on that and I'm not even allowed to read the article and put it on my channel. I tried doing that with something, something else and they said, nope, sorry, we're going to block it. And so copyright's a, a pain. Mark, do you mind? I want to ask a question just because I'm teaching this class to middle school students on podcasting. What would your advice be to my students as far as becoming successful podcasters? If you had to give them one or two important tips. Oh, tips. Um, 
try to be a couple yeah there's a couple things i could recommend i mean you know i've got my own youtube channel and it does pretty well even though i don't i mean i do some podcasts um i've got one called strange world uh the one is be yourself don't try to copy others because eventually people will don't try to copy formulas necessarily that other people do try to create your own path your your own niche whatever you enjoy doing you know there's an old saying which i uh, i enjoy which is if you if you find a job you love you'll never work a day in your life and it's true even with podcasting find something you like talking about and if you can talk about it with passion and conviction other people will jump onto that and they will realize that people love to hear enthusiasm and so whatever it is, I don't care how stupid or weird you think it is, you know, I'm talking about flat earth, go with it, you know, and, and don't, again, don't, don't try to copycat any, anything that's already out there. Cause it's been done a million times. Um, that'd be yeah. the, that'd be the first thing. Um, keep it and keep it somewhat interesting. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, if you are really enthusiastic about potato salad, that's great, but I don't know if a lot of people are going to want to hear about it, potato salad unless you have something weird to add <laughs> about a potato salad. Um, and if you're going to do it, uh, try to do it with two or three people also, if you can, because it, there's, it's, it, it always, there, there's a reason why radio stations do have two or three or sometimes four or five people in a room and make sure you, you learn, you know, those people and I know, I know I'm talking to, to younger guys here, um, which is make sure, you know, you have a, like a, like a rapport, you know, you're, you're looking for people, you're looking for people that can, that have the, what's known as the gift of gab, who they can just chat, you know, and you'll know this because if they're like, if they're hanging around each other off air, they can talk for hours, you know, they get on yeah. a subject and they can like talk and talk and talk and talk. If you have that, if you have, if you know a group of guys like that, or you know, you know, friends like that, that you're like that in, in smaller personal settings, that works uh, because people love, you know, dead air, you know, dead air, of course, is, is the bane of, of podcasts, but that's, that, that'd be the, the big things to recommend. Uh, keep it original. Um, keep, you know, keep, try to keep, make it interesting. Of course, and I know that's easier said than done. And make sure that you have a good group of people that just love talking about stuff anything and not and and willing to go down paths that they wouldn't that, that they wouldn't normally go and of course try to keep it politically somewhat politically correct because nowadays i mean 10 years ago i wouldn't have said that but nowadays you've got to play it pretty straight you you can't just go off the rails you know don't go after demographics don't you know, if you're going to talk about conspiracies, keep it fairly light if you can, because there's some conspiracies we, we aren't even allowed to talk about. Flat Earth, I'm just lucky, you know, that, that it's a topic that, you know, it's still fair game. So there you go. Yeah. Um, so I have another question. Yeah. So do you believe anything that NASA tells you? No, <laughs> I don't. Uh, and here, no, there's it's that's that's probably the easiest answer. I was gonna, I was trying to think of a longer way of explaining that, uh, but the, the short answer is no. The reason is right. the reason is because and 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 I know you know being an American, you're not really supposed to say that. You know, go rah rah team, wave the flag, NAS is great. Um, but at the same time, look, the, there are secrets that are kept in the military. We, we keep secrets all the time. I mean, I'm not talking about the obvious things like, you know, spy programs and, and counterintelligence and stuff like that. But, you know, even our own Air Force pilots aren't even are not allowed to talk about their missions, even with their families. They used to back in the day, but not anymore. The, the, it's everything, everything is classified. So when it comes to NASA, all they do, what I'm saying is that the entire reason NASA was built was to keep our world under wraps for for lack of a better term and that means mercury and gemini and apollo and the space shuttle program and the sts program and the um and of course the iss uh the the moon footage has aged horribly i mean i could send you just a handful of images 
uh, you know, not even they're not even special images. They're just from the NASA archives. And I say, look, there's got to be at least half a dozen things wrong with this photograph that it is not aged well. The video is aged terribly. The still photographs are way too perfect for for what they are. And, uh, you know, the, everything that NASA does. Let me let me end it with this. Everything that NASA does is about a space beat, like a drum beat, which is they don't care if you read the article. They don't care if you even look at the headline too much. All they really care about is if you look at the little thumbnail or, or image that they have and maybe, maybe look at the headline that goes just a few words that goes with it. Meaning, uh, oh, hey, there's an interesting thing that could be a face on Mars. Uh, we're reclassifying Pluto. Oh, look, here's a new spot on Jupiter and so on and so on. They do that for one reason, and that is the subtext, which is face on Mars, you're on a globe, Saturn globe, Pluto globe. Everything, everything they ever say is reinforcing that you're on a globe. That's all they care about. That's, that's been the goal since minute one. That's the reason why there's a globe in almost every classroom in the United States and industrialized nations. So wait, I, I have not watched your documentary. You have not? How dare you, ma'am? <laughs> How dare you? No, but anyway, I'm, I'm but that's okay. Have you, well, have you even looked at my channel? Do you know anything about me? I could be a serial killer. Why are you letting these kids talk to me? <laughs> Seriously. Wait, what happened? Can't hear you guys. Oh. Your, your timing was perfect, by the way. <laughs> Are you still there? Guys? Hello? 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 Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, um, hold up. Uh, I just switched spot because there's not that much reception. Oh, okay. No, uh, no worries. We're doing a podcast, like, no, it was, it was perfect timing. Uh, I was explaining how I could be a serial killer and then I get hung up. And it's like, oh no! <laughs> They figured out I actually I actually was a serial killer. Uh, well, anyway, so sorry um, uh, to to the teacher in question. Um, so you hadn't seen the documentary, but your question was. Uh, hold on. Uh, one second. We're gonna try to get a room. Is there a room? somewhere uh, that we could record a podcast? We have to move because we have bad reception. Well, it wasn't that uh, bad. Um, because uh, all right, we're gonna, just gonna go into the closet and record. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, we have a better session. So it's a struggle. That that's okay. I I know schools have budgets. Yeah. So, so what was your answer? Do you think all the uh, do you think all the uh, plants are flat, or do you think they're uh, they just don't exist? I just think they're pretty images in the sky. Um, and I know I'm older, so I've had a chance to to go to planetariums when I was younger. Uh, and if you don't know what a planetarium is, it's, you know, like a small indoor, you know, like a, like a basketball stadium, only you take all the chairs out and then you display the star systems and the moon and the planets on the ceiling. So what's the difference between that and what we could be living in now? Why, why isn't it possible that we're living in a giant planetarium uh, like the, the one that was done in the 1998 movie The Truman Show? You know, that was like mm -hmm. a 20 mile wide planetarium and it completely fooled him because the, the saying in that movie is we believe the world that is presented to us. So if you were born yeah. into a building, if this isn't some little rock flying through a universe, we're just in a, a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. Who's to say that we're not? And you can't, you can't exactly use uh, the space programs as proof because, like, for example, the space programs didn't prove it was a globe. They didn't even say it was a globe. It's not like NASA in 1972 said, oh, yeah, by the way, we're on a globe. We've known for at least 500 years. The question is, how did you know? You didn't know. I mean, we didn't even have rockets. We didn't have a space program. So how did they know 500 years ago? Geometry? That's that's what you got. You you don't know because you because you have proof. You know because you were told. Like everything in, in this yeah. world, uh, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll use a, a real quick one for you. Um, what year is it right now? It's 2019, right? 
Well, well, according to what exactly? It's not like our civilization is 2,000 years old. Uh, and it's not, it's not as though, you know, anything it's like, like the, um, uh, the, the Chinese calendar is at least twice that Chinese calendar is in the four thousands. So why do all our calendars, including the one on your phone, why does it say 2019? Uh, because a group of people just decided that at some point and people just take it yep. at face value. So it's not 2019. It's absolutely not, but it's just the date that's thrown out. It's like, oh, it's that's just the one that we're going to use as, as the benchmark. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, as you know, there was Area 51 there. Are you going to be there, or what do you think in Area 51? Oh, I think they can reverse technology, but is it from our... Uh, is it alien technology? What what I mean is, when I got into flat Earth, uh, I had to reclassify things. I, do I think there's things flying around up there in the sky that aren't us? Oh yeah, absolutely. I've seen them with night vision. You want to have some fun? Go to Amazon and buy a pair of um, night vision binoculars in five power. I think it costs like four hundred bucks or change or something like that. And you can mm -hmm. stare you can stare at the sky. There's absolutely stuff flying around up there all day long that is not us. Um, are they from Venus and Mars and Jupiter? No. No, I think they're just older versions of our civilization. If our civilization only goes back 5,000 years on broken history, then yeah. I, you know, I don't think we're the first people to rent this apartment by, by any stretch. So, yeah. I, so Area 51, could they be reverse engineering uh, uh, ancient technology? Sure. Why, why, why not? Um, it's, it's very, very possible. In fact, look, w there's a reason why, and I know people get upset because it's a secret military base, but come on, we have, it's not the only secret military base we have. You know, we pay a lot of money to keep military secrets. And if they're reverse engineering, I mean, could they be doing biological weapons? Could they be doing uh, mm -hmm. atomic, new atomic weapons or particle beam weapons? Yeah. Sure. But could they be reverse engineering? Look, if you have to have a place, if you find something really weird, out there I, I, let's go like back to raiders of the lost ark if you find the ark of the covenant you've got you can't just take it to a normal military base you've got to have bases that are technically off the map and uh area 51's a, a good choice a quick story in fact i'll tell you about area 51 which i love um uh and, and this goes shows you how high up on the food chain it is um general eisenhower dwight eisenhower who was the um uh, the NATO commander, one of our last five-star generals. He was president of the United States before Kennedy. And yeah. he was, it, like Area 51, the, the rumor goes is that he was built without his knowledge at all. And it was almost completed. And he found out about it and said, uh, uh, hey, call, he calls him up and says, hey, I'd like to come out and have a tour. And they said, sorry, you don't have clearance. And that's the president of the United States. The president of the United States is just a spokesperson for a political body. As far as the, the hierarchy goes, he's not even close to being the top of the food chain. He's just a guy that gets in front of a microphone and represents two political houses. That's all he does. And Eisenhower, of course, got really bent out of shape because he's like, uh, I used to be a five-star general. And so he made some threats because he had friends that were also generals. And, and he ended up going in and taking a tour, supposedly. But so that kind of shows you there are there are secrets that can be kept. Yeah. Um. So in the documentary, uh, sorry, not in the documentary. I was reading something on the news the other day, and it said that you left. I think what I understood from it is that you left a conference early when you thought when uh, Logan Paul was. Uh, yeah. Be... Yeah. Lo Logan Paul's a terrible person. <laughs> He's awful. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of uh, people who get paid to do practical jokes on other people. And he was, you know, he's gotten paid quite well from YouTube over the years for doing this. He kind of took over. And I know you guys aren't old enough to remember uh, the um, the Johnny Knoxville MTV Jackass team. They uh, they did stuff for years back in the late '90s and early 2000s, and they quit before yeah. YouTube started. Yeah started yeah. up uh, you you remember that one yeah we, we've heard about it okay They're perfect all... well that that's where logan paul kind of took over and he ran out of people to prank in the united states and so when he went over and did that japanese suicide forest uh, I, I took personal offense to that. I mean, suicide is, is not something to be taken lightly. And the Japanese, of course, have a whole nother look on, on death and suicide than we do. 
and uh, and he was you know he he turned it into entertainment, and I think he should mm-hmm. be blackballed from social media for life. And you know he's he's not going away quietly, and he tried to use us to kind of re jumpstart his his career. And I, I wasn't going to stand for it. So when I was there, and I found, yeah. and, and it was kept a secret from us. We did not. He told us, or he told the promoter not to tell anybody. So I only found out the night before. I was already there. I was already at the hotel. And when I found out and got confirmation of it, I, I said, "Nope, not gonna, not gonna have any of it." And so I just got on a plane, flew back to Seattle, and and that was it. Um, but I was vindicated later because you know when he finally, three months later after he he released his his piece on us. You know, he was just, oh my lord, he was making so much fun of us. And that's what I predicted was, was going to happen. I mean, the guy's never made a serious video in his entire life. And uh, mm-hmm. so, anyway, if you're a fan of Logan Paul, hey, it's great and, and wonderful. But eventually you'll grow yeah. out of it. Because the... Mm-hmm. And I'm, uh, so. Um, I want to say something. Have you ever heard the theory about, like, a fake YouTuber? It's not a YouTuber. They're basically an actor. They act like they make them make it their, themselves but it's just like uh people like, people that like pretend they're they're doing sort of they pretend it's real kind of like a reality show but it's not real and in, in, it's in the slightest on youtube kind of like that yeah oh yeah. yeah it happens happens all the time um two two pieces i could give for you real quick um one would be oh well three things <laughs> i'll give you really fast uh, one would be there was like a like a bounty hunter, a guy that repos cars and stuff like that, and you could tell all the people you know he has an you know he he plays it off like it's absolutely real, but they're all actors. I mean it's blatant. The script the scripting's terrible, but he never he never at any point says that it's that it's not real. Uh, and and you can, personally I, I think you can get into some trouble for that. Um, the second thing which would be much bigger would be like PewDiePie. And I know you guys know who that is, you know, supposedly the, the biggest, one of the yep. biggest YouTube channels in the world. He is absolutely known for buying subscribers and likes and, and hits. And because here's the thing, and I, and I, I, there are other people out there that have done it. Heck, I've seen people in the YouTube community, smaller channels that have done it, which is you get paid. Like if you, if you make a video on YouTube, you get paid per numbers of hits you get. Yeah. And they, they will send you money. Google will send you a check. I get a check from Google, a small one, you know, for, for the hits I get. Well, you can take that money and you can go buy more hits from a third-party company, usually in Europe, sometimes in Asia. And then you get some of that money back because you all of a sudden given yourself hits. I mean, you get this kind of this rebate thing happening. And of course, legitimate people then, you know, get onto your channel. It gets bigger and bigger. But you don't know how many subs are actually real and and are fake. But you just keep sinking money into it. Then all of a sudden your numbers start getting so high that it doesn't make sense. I mean, why would PewDiePie, who's just a, a troll, he's literally just an internet troll from Sweden, who... Um, uh, he's, he's got what, three times the amount of subs as like, he's got more subs than Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift and Katy Perry combined. And he doesn't yeah. do it. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> he literally, he's, he start his channel started out because he made a Minecraft video making fun of a Minecraft zombie walking into a Minecraft tree. That, that was, that was how he got started. And it's like, oh yeah, I got a few million hits. All he did was laugh during the video. He doesn't generate any content. So is there, there's some legitimacy problems definitely inside YouTube, but it's not just a YouTube, but let me throw another one real quick. There's a wonderful story on Fox because the internet hive mind misses nothing, which is why I put the flat earth out there for everybody. It's like, look, I hive mind, yeah. tell me where it went wrong. Where this girl from Instagram, uh, this pretty blonde girl was traveling around in exotic places in different parts of the world. And then people started looking at these shots and all of a sudden they realized she kept using the same cloud formations in the background. She was cut and pasting the the weather behind her. It didn't matter what the landscape was. She kept using the same, you know, not all the time, but there was at least five or six instances where she used the same clouds. Yeah. Well, it's like, okay, what's real about that? Or or the girl last month that um, supposedly was like, oh yeah, here I am hiking at this wildlife park, and her sister called her out on it. It's like, no, I took the shot. We were in her backyard, <laughs> and it just looked like it was like a wildlife park. So yeah, there's some massive legitimacy issues out there on the internet. It's really and it's really tough to prove. I mean, anything could be faked nowadays. Hence NASA. 
So I have another question. So we have to uh, start for today too. Can we get out to class two forty five? Okay. Is there? Can we talk to you tomorrow? <laughs> uh what is it tomorrow friday what am i doing hang on let me look do i have time tomorrow if you want to talk to me tomorrow sure i'll talk to you sure you want you want to do it at the same same time or what do you want to do uh, we can do it um i'm not trying to go talk to my teachers Te about you, that. you let me know let let me know yeah. i will make time for you you caught me on a good week because i don't have a, a meetup to go to until Sunday and I'm still in the country until uh, next week. So yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, that'd be so great. Um, so is, tomorrow is it okay for you, right? Or have a couple of students to actually ask you some questions on like why do you think that the Earth flies? Stuff yeah. Like the bottom. Yeah, yeah. You can ask. Yeah, ask. Ask me whatever you want. Yeah. So what if a couple of students come in, ask a couple of questions? Because uh, they're I told them about it, so like I got Mark starting to like. Okay, cool. But then they're curious, like, how does someone believe that the Earth flies? Like, why don't you ask him? Yeah, I'm thinking that'd be a great idea if they ask, if they ask you. Sure. And, stuff, and that'd just be really great. Sure. Ha happy to. Yeah. Absolutely happy to. All right. So, hey, so before you go, do you want me to, so I'm recording this. Do you want me to, your email, you know where my email is, right? It's um, it's in the, it's in the, yeah, dis I, this, this description box of every single video I make. Just email me. Don't text me, email me, and then I will shoot, I will, I will take the audio files and I will shoot them to you through, uh, we transfer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'll be, uh, really great. Awesome. Uh, so then, thank you so much and we're going to talk to you tomorrow then. <laughs> okay. You have a good rest right. of your afternoon and have your teacher watch the documentary. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll keep on telling her. Watch the documentary. Watch the documentary. Watch the documentary. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you so much again. All right. Have a good one. Yep. You too. Bye. Hello. Hello. All right. Um. So I have a couple of my friends here. Uh, okay. So can you just say, uh, sitting on speakerphone? Can you just say like what your beliefs are? Uh, and like what you've done, your documentary, your book, stuff like that. Quick sure. That. sure, 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 sure. So my name is Mark Sargent. I'm up in Seattle, Washington, and I was the one that started the Flat Earth Clues series. I built those in 2015, which eventually led to the 2018 documentary called Behind the Clue. I'm sorry, Behind the Clues, Behind the Curve, which uh, most people probably saw on Netflix. And I currently believe that the world is not this little rock flying through space, that it is actually the, a building. You're living in a structure with walls and a floor and a ceiling that's very, very, very large. And that our best and brightest people didn't even figure it out until about 1960. And when they did, they just decided to keep it a secret for as long as possible. And that ends about mm -hmm. now. There you go. All right. Um, so I was talking to one of my teachers about it and they were wondering how the seasons work. Um, sure. cause yeah. Can you tell us how the seasons work? Yeah. 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 So if the sun and the moon are really, really small compared to the world, so the sun isn't hundreds of thousands of miles wide and the moon isn't 2000 miles wide, but let's focus on the sun because that's really, uh, what everyone asks about the seasons. So, and I know you guys are really young and you've probably never seen a record player in your life. But uh, the needle on a record moves forwards in towards the center. It never takes the same path twice. That would kind of be how the seasons work with the, um, the flat earth models. So the sun is really, really tiny. I mean, like maybe 50 miles across and really, really close, maybe less than 3000 miles high. And w because of that, it moves in a, you know, a slightly different path. It's like a mobile above a child's crib. And it also is not the primary, I mean, it's not just the only heat source. There's also the jet stream. There's also the underwater conveyor system, which is in the oceans, and then the magma system down below. But the combination of all those things, it's pretty easy to manipulate the seasons. Okay. Um, so one of my uh, friends uh, has a question. Uh, did astronauts go to the moon? No. No, the United States, the Americans never went to the moon. It was a sham since minute one. As a matter of fact, it's even. Did anyone? I'm sorry. Say it again. Did, did anyone go to the moon? 
No, no, nobody's nobody's ever been to the moon. You can't do anything on the moon. The moon is tiny. Uh, the moon can't even be reached with conventional means. In fact, the moon may not even be okay. a three-dimensional object. It may just be uh, an image sitting on a television screen with really, really high mm -hmm. resolution. Uh, but yeah. no, the Americans never went there. All right. Um. So, uh, there's so what I've heard about the fire uh, is that they seasons actually change and the sun gets closer to the center of the quarter yeah and then it moves in okay um wouldn't that make the days shorter or because they're in a smaller circle well here's the thing the sun may not even be a um a region-wide phenomenon meaning and i don't know if you, i mean if you guys know software at all i, I know you're a little young but uh we do, we've been doing something in software for the last 20 years called instancing which means the sun may be localized per region, meaning the sun that you see right now may not be the same sun they see in South America. It may be a different object. I'm I'm not sure, to be honest. To you know what what we know about the sun in the last four years and the moon is it, it just it keeps breaking down barriers. So it, the sun the sun is not may not even be a, a three dimensional object. Yeah. Um, so one of my friends has a question, so it would it be fine if they asked you? Sure. Um, I was wondering where would the gravity or like the core that was bringing everything down or the gravity? Yeah, no, so no, how, it's, does that's, gravity yeah, how does gravity work? And that's a great question because uh, the world's most famous scientist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and well, just about any scientist, you can ask any scientist, they'll tell you the same thing. And that is they can't even tell you what gravity is. They can only tell you what gravity does. They can't reproduce it, but they can tell you the symptoms of gravity. You know, you drop something, obviously it falls to the ground. That appears to be gravity. Uh, does that, is that based off of density? Maybe, I suppose. It all, I mean, meaning the density of the earth. It also could be, be based on the density of the atmosphere. You remember, for example, like you're breathing in just a thin version of water. You take like a volleyball yeah. or a basketball and you put it under water. What happens? It pops up to the top. Why? Because it's mm -hmm. less dense than the water that it's sitting in um but the short answer is this mainstream says that there's this magical molecular force that pulls everything to the center of a giant ball we say or i say anyway that it's a mag magical molecular force that just pulls things straight down there's re really hardly any difference at all between what i think gravity is and what science thinks that gravity is mm -hmm. Uh, so or, or here, here, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a game reference since you guys know it. Uh, any of you guys play like Fortnite or Warcraft? Uh, yeah, I used to play Fortnite a little bit ago. All right, all right. Well, what's what's gravity in Fortnite? You know, you're jumping up and down, and you know it appears like there's some sort of gravity. That's just a physics engine. That's a, just an engine that's built into the software that says, okay, you objects are going to fall at a certain rate of speed. What's the difference between that and what you're walking around right now? In fact, who's to say that you're not in some sort of digital world at this point? But mm -hmm. anyway, next question. So like digital world, do you mean like Matrix or something like that? Or well, sure. Like I mean, again, you know, the difference between a game like Fortnite and what you're doing right now is really just levels of resolution and a few extra senses. You know, we you know, in the gaming world, you have sight, you have sound. Uh, but in this world, you have sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. It wouldn't be that, you know, we're only talking about levels of software. And what I'm saying is this. If, if we are in some sort of enclosed world, if you're living inside a building, then there is a high degree of probability that it's virtual. And, and any, any, any high-ranking scientist will tell you this. They, they've been seeing this all the time. If you want to look up something fun, look up something called the double slit experiment which has been around the science world for decades and decades. And the, in fact, they kind of perfected it around 2005, which says that whatever's behind you, whatever you're not looking at is not being rendered at its highest form. And that shouldn't be possible because remember, this is the real world, right? Well, anyway, I also recommend if you, if you want to look up a movie that's kind of fun, look up the 1999 movie. I mean, The Matrix is good, but look up the 1999 movie, uh, The 13th Floor. It's brilliant. <laughs> Um, so like, uh, one of my friends also has a question. Yeah. So you said that the sun works like a record player in a needle. 
how would night work if it's just constantly spinning above us? Ah, good one. Okay, so like for example, you're not if the sun is really really small. So I, I, the question is, why is it all? Why isn't it just daylight all the time, right? You know, if the sun is is right above us, why you know isn't it like a light bulb and it's shining on us at all times? Yes and no. Um, remember, the atmosphere that you're breathing in is like a thin version of water. Um, water is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and you're breathing in four parts nitrogen, one part oxygen. In fact, you're not really breathing in that much oxygen. So you're yeah. you're 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 kind of living around in a thin version of water. My question to you is this, and you'll you'll get this. If you've ever seen pictures, and I know you, none of you probably scuba dive, but if you go down even a couple hundred feet, it gets really, really dark underwater. Why? You know, even at high noon, why doesn't the sun penetrate the water? All, all the versions of the water, it's right above you. Why doesn't it penetrate it? Because the atmosphere, or because the water has a thickness. The atmosphere has a thickness too. So when it goes off into the distance, it appears like it's setting, but it's not. In fact, you can watch all sorts of videos that we made to where you can see the sun. It looks like it's setting off in the distance, but you crank up your digital zoom on whatever camera you have and the sun will pop back up. And how is that possible? It's not unless, of course, it's traveling over a flat surface. Mm -hmm. So also with the sun uh, and the moon, uh, scientists say that it affects the, uh, the tides and stuff. Talk, 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 talk louder into the microphone. Okay. Um, so scientists say that the sun and the moon, those affect the tides. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, the sun, the yeah. sun would have no effect on the tides whatsoever, but the moon, no. This mainstream science says that the moon has an effect on the tides. Well, if we're living in some sort of enclosed structure and the moon is, I don't know, 50 miles wide, then the last thing you would do is attach some sort of directional magnetism force to it. So, no, the, the tides aren't affected by the moon at all. The, um, the tides would be affected from, from underneath. Again, kind of no different than a physics engine that we use in the virtual world. Um, it's way easier to control gravity. Because remember, tides are just an, uh, a version of gravity. Um, the, it's way easier to control it from, un, from underneath than it would be directionally from up above, especially the really, really small object. So, no, so the moon has no effect. Now, do things happen when the moon goes by? Sure, but remember, the sky, in our in our version, the sky and the stars and the planets are just some very complex clock system that tells you when things happen. But the actual physics involved tied to that clock system are happening down on the ground. Um, yeah. Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question. Why can't we get to the edge of the Earth? Because you're not allowed to go to the edge of the Earth, plain and simple. Um, the beginning of the edge of the Earth would be the Antarctic coastline. But the Antarctic Treaty that was put into place in 1959 says that no corporation from any country anywhere can set up shop there. That's for one. I mean, there's like, what, 5,000 people, unless you're talking about secret military bases, less than 5,000 people in the entire continent of, of Antarctica. The actual edge would be thousands of miles inland. So the white part of Antarctica, you know, the, the edge, the, the coastline of Antarctica is just the beginning. You would have to go thousands of miles inland and you're just not going to have access to that. The Antarctic Treaty forbids any uh, unsanctioned exploration by anybody. So anybody that says that they, they cross the Antarctic, you know, with a, with a dog, you know, with a, um, a sled. Yeah, they didn't. Trust me on this. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, Ask anything. I don't care. All right. Um. So, what yeah. do you think the most? Uh, who's so in your film? I forgot who was in the documentary behind the curve. Yeah. Uh, who's remind me? Who's uh, he who must not be named? Oh, he who who shall not be named. Well, I mean, we can name him. That's Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, the world's okay. mo the world's most popular scientist. He he does not he doesn't hate flat Earth. He just thinks it's a failure of the education system. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, by the way, was also the same guy that said that science is true whether or not you believe in it. And I think that's one of the most arrogant things ever ever spoken. So, for example, yeah, fine. You want to tell me you know tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level. Yeah, fine. You can go test that. 
but then you tell me what the core of the earth looks like. And I say, okay, well, the core of the earth supposedly is 4,000 miles straight down. The deepest hole that's been ever drilled ever has been eight miles. Not 4,000, not 2,000, not 1,000, eight miles. That's a, barely a fraction of a percentage. And yet they're telling you exactly what the core of the, the, the earth looks like with, with what instrumentation. And in the fine print, they will tell you. It's like, oh, well, okay, we have no idea what's happening down there. Well, okay, then why do you show us the cross sections of the earth? I mean, everybody knows, you guys have seen them. The cross sections showing, you know, the, the yellow and white and orange and red bands. How, where, where did they get that? They didn't. They, they just took a guess and then they just said, okay, well, that's, that's what it is. It's like, no, I don't yeah. think so. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to, lunch is about over for us. So thank okay. you again so much for coming off to the podcast. Oh yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Ha happy to do it. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll send you the, the audio file like I did yesterday. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one.